And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Nord Games, previously known as the developers of Dangerous Destinations, now working on the Oracle Story Generator, which has managed to get funding 17 times over. Congratulations on that, by the way. The one and only Chris Haskins. How are you doing today, man? <laughs> Thanks for the intro. I It's only 10 a.m., so I'm not quite drunk, but I'm, I'm definitely up for talking about gaming and uh, you know anything you want to get into. I have to deal with time zones all the time so so I can actually use the <laughs> it's five o'clock somewhere excuse. That's true. I mean, it's a glimpse behind the, the curtain right now, but it is actually, you know, 10 a.m. on a Monday. <laughs> or tw or 12, 12 over here because, well, I'm too well time zones. I hate well, like you said, like you said, it's five o'clock somewhere. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, hopefully someone's going to be listening to this uh, after happy hour, or, you know, after happy hour started and they'll get into it uh, with some, well, my, my preferred uh, drink is mead, but I'm Scandinavian. So, you know, whatever, uh, whatever floats your boat, get a pint of it. Well, me well, mead's, mead's certainly on my list. The only thing, the only thing that's on, the only thing that's on my do not drink list is wine. And that's because. One of my professors um, scared me off. Scared me off wine with the horror story of the um, wine po of the Veda Katzwein incidents in um, mm. Austria. Mm, I'm not familiar with those. Uh, I thought you were going to say tequila, which uh, most of my friends are like, "No tequila for me, thanks." And I'm like, "Oh, more for me." So yeah, I, I like I've a good tequila. Never had tequila. Oh, it's so good. Well, the good stuff's good, but that's pretty true with most alcoholic beverages so uh yeah but then uh anyway hopefully someone's out there having something tasty mm -hmm. so with that kind of thing in, with that kind of thing in mind let's get let's let's dive let's dive head for let's dive head first into the crazy so the oracle story generator um now i will admit the ed the idea of a ran of random generation using tarot size cards is um something i'm not exactly a stranger to have having having backed um the the two the two running um versions of Fatum, although that's character creation. How did the, how did this little idea come to be? Well, originally it was um, it was thought up as a tool that might help with uh, creating stories on the fly or helping to inspire me when I was writing, uh, writing just creatively or, or writing for uh, role-playing games. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to establish a who, what, where, why, when, answer all these questions and sort of like in a Mad Lib uh, format. Mm -hmm. And then I started to think about, well, how could this be converted into cards? Maybe on each card there is a who and a what and a why, and that card itself could be used as a story or could be combined with other cards to create different combinations of the story. And then when we actually got together as a group, uh, our creative team, and started talking about different ideas, and I brought up this idea about a story generator, and we started to determine well is that how useful is that and and uh would would people be interested in that but also its presentation is there a better way to do it we eventually shifted a little bit and we came up with having separate cards for separate concepts so we turned them into actors actions subjects, intents, and developments. So the actor sort of took over for the who, mm -hmm. but you don't just get one actor on a card, you get one overarching concept for an actor, and then you get four different options that are derived from that overarching concept. So if you have a warlord as the main concept, you're given four options as to the nature of that warlord, uh, personality maybe, or uh, just how powerful they are, you know, what sort of influence that they have, that kind of thing. Then moving on to intents, you have, again, 
an overarching concept, but then four specific intents that are derived from that concept. Uh, equally so on the subject and the um, uh, and the action and, and all that. Uh, and then the development, uh, again, you've got an overarching theme for the development, but then you've got specifics. But developments are sort of a catch-all. They can be uh, like what happened after uh, the events uh, what are some like maybe um, uh, secret information or uh, as a result of, or there's someone who intends to uh, betray the main, the main character of the story, you know, these kinds of things. And then again, they have four more specific details on each development card. So when you combine it all together, the 60 card deck, that is a specific, specific specific theme, let's say contracts and bounties. You've got 60 cards in this theme and they're divided into five different card types, which means there's 12 cards of each type. And then if you do the math on all that, it basically it's uh, uh, 250 million combinations per deck is, is what you come out to mm -hmm. um, for all the different possible combinations that you can generate and that kind of thing i think is very useful and it can not only inspire you uh in creating your role-playing game adventures but also just in general creative writing around fantasy themes mm -hmm. and that that does bring that does bring me to one one question that i, that I was going to have would it now I know that or I know that Oracle is is going is meant to be system agnostic. Since it is it's more, yeah. since it's more about story ideas rather than any sort of crunch. Yeah. But is it is it also um, is it also genre ag agnostic? This one is fantasy themed. We may have other genres that come in later mm -hmm. uh, in future products, but this one right now is fantasy themed. Primarily because that's the largest market at this point in time for role-playing games is in the fantasy world. Mm -hmm. uh, Sci-fi and, and noir and, and all that stuff, uh, they're pretty distant seconds and thirds and fourths and whatnot. So I think going after, and plus fantasy is my favorite theme, so that's where my brain went to first. But um, we may bring in other themes at some point in time. We just have to assess the viability of it. There's an awful lot of resources that go into creating these products. So we want to make sure that they are uh, going to sell. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. Create awesome products that people will buy. Mm -hmm. Now, within that, you, meant, you mentioned theme. And there, uh, with um, each of these 60 card decks having having different theme, um, contra whether it be contracts and bounties, epic adventures, political intrigue, relics and artifacts, and side quests, um, mm -hmm. I would like I would like to go into a bit go into a bit of a bit of respective detail with those with those particular um, themes and what and what someone can expect and and what they um, what that particular deck might be used for, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, so with, let's say, starting from the top, uh, contracts and bounties, mm -hmm. I'm just going to read from you uh, the description on the Kickstarter. Uh, stories within this deck are based on uh, a creature or creatures, including beasts, monsters, and humanoids who have a price on their head. So this is the kind of uh, story that could be used for if you're playing d d It's uh, uh, maybe a single session adventure or could be multi-session adventures. Uh, it could also be a recurring villain uh, that you know, comes and goes during the course of your adventure. So this one is pretty versatile and will consist of the, um, the, uh, the concept of a creature or creatures have done a thing and now someone is hiring, let's say the main characters of the story, probably your adventuring party, to go and hunt them down. Uh, return them alive, dead, make sure that they can't do what they were doing again, what have you. So that's really the, the, the gist of the contracts and bounties 
theme. When it comes to epic adventures, it says stories within this deck are based around top tier villains and the dastardly deeds they embark upon, they embark upon in the pursuit of their maniacal intents. So this one really more of an overarching storyline. You can, if you want, have multiple stories all running uh, together where you have maybe an overarching villain, but then you've got bosses at various points during your adventure that you create additional stories, but they're connected somehow to the uh, the, the bigger storyline. So this one's really fun. Uh, probably something for more multi-session adventures uh, if you're playing role-playing games or your overall story uh, with the big bad. Uh, political intrigue stories within this deck are based around ruling classes, guilds, cults, and other such organizations, uh, delving deep into their relationships and motivations during their pursuit of power and wealth. So things in here relate a lot more to uh, backstabbing and uh, influence and assassinations and this kind of thing. So political intrigue, anything and everything you can think of that uh, would be, you know, things between merchants and nobility and different, like it says, guilds and cults and stuff like that uh, would be found inside of this deck. Mm -hmm. uh, relics and artifacts uh, are based around creation, use, and reverence of the most powerful items your worlds have ever known. So this is really more to do with uh, someone has forged a new item. So they have stolen this item. They have hidden this item. This item needs to be recovered. That kind of thing is what you're going to find in Relics and Artifacts. And then finally, the simple side quests, uh, just as the name implies, they are simple by design, but crucial for building a vast world that exists regardless of interaction from your story's main characters. So this is really helpful when it comes to filling in all the gaps within your world and making it feel a lot more lived in uh, than um, uh, some of us are, are capable of doing. And with simple side quests, you have a lot of things that need doing. Mm -hmm. And they're things that can get the main characters a little bit of coin, a little bit of information, that kind of thing, in order to advance the story uh a bit further uh and you know who doesn't love a little side quests you can throw in there and in this case one of the best ways of creating a little adventure on the fly throw out the five cards in this deck and you know go on a little adventure in order to put a little bit more coin in your pocket mm -hmm. now even now even though this even though this is clearly skewed towards um fa towards fantasy um one per one one particular issue that can always that can always come up whenever 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 the fantasy question is brought up is is what is what kind um i've um i even though even though it's gotten a bit repetitive over the years i've ta i've talked about this whenever i've had to discuss d and d's particular brand of fantasy and its half in half out attitude about what kind of fantasy it is um but what? But um, was there was there an effort made to make sh to make sure that it that even though it's skewing towards fantasy, it's not trying to skew too much towards one particular subtype? Are you referring to like low fantasy and high fantasy and that kind of thing? Yeah, um, it's really up to your interpretation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say that high fantasy relies heavily on magic being very prevalent. Uh, but there's certain ways in which we wrote things like one one card, uh, I believe, talks about the concept of uh, enchant. And it doesn't specify whether it's talking about the act of enchanting by magical means or by charisma, meaning you're so enchanting. You know, you, I, I, I love you so much because of how enchanting you are, that kind of thing. So it actually is written to be ambiguous so that it is more interpretable and more uh and more, and more versatile uh one of the our goals in every single product that we uh create is that we want them to be as versatile as possible while also being as detailed as possible 
So we have to find that happy medium in there somewhere. Uh, and so we haven't written this specifically for any low, high, medium fantasy. It's going to work with your story no matter what. If you're going, you know, for the high fantasy or low fantasy, doesn't matter. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll it'll work with what you're creating. Yeah. Now, with the with that kind with that in mind, um, when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the um when it comes to the cards the cards themselves, um. Now, if I, if I'm reading this correctly, the it is split it is split into several sub several um subtypes actors actions subjects intents and developments mm -hmm. um so what would it be a, um would it be a case that if, if somebody is you is using one of these decks they'd um they take one they take one card from each yes so you you draw one actor one action one subject one intent and one development. They're color coded in such a way that it's it's obvious what they are. And uh, with that, you'd line them up in that same order, and you'd find out who the actor is, what their action uh, was or is. It, it, it depends on on how you want to structure it. It could be something that is happening in the future. It could be something that has already happened. It could be something that's happening now. Uh, then you determine uh, the subjects, who is. Who is the actor acting upon? Uh, and then you find out their intents. You know what what were the actors' intents with their actions? And then you've got the developments. And again, the developments can be a, a lot of different things. They're sort of a catch-all for um, what happens uh, as a result, or are there uh, other other factors at play here? And we've written everything in such a way that every single card in a specific theme works no matter what, as long as it's placed in the right order in the, um, in the story. Mm -hmm. Now in the, in the, um, in the setup, on, in the setup on the page, there was a, there was a sample card given that had the keyword description options and details and the like. Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes to when it comes to the options and details, I'm guessing that e I'm guessing that each card, no matter what, has four, has four options. It does, yes. Um, within the now, is it is it is it a requ is it a requirement that pe that people pick one of the options, or is it just there to add more um, add more flavor? It's just there to add more flavor if they want. So uh, the example given is a warlord, mm -hmm. uh, but. The four options underneath that are humanoid, monstrous, construct, and aberration. And all of these concepts have a little bit of uh, explanation on them. So it says a warlord, uh, and then below it says warlords are military commanders who are dedicated to their cause and rulers, um, uh, rulership through domination of their hordes, legions, or peoples. Then below that, it's giving you four different options. One says humanoids, because humanoid warlords take a range of forms, et cetera, et cetera, and gives you more explanation there. Monstrous, and then it says monstrous warlords tend to be blah, 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 blah. Construct, built for war, constructs, warlords, blah, 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 blah. And then aberration, unlike other warlords, aberrations, et cetera, et cetera. And keeps on you know, going into more detail. So you may have a few sentences attached to each concept if you uh, if there's that much detail around them so uh around each specific so there's quite a lot of content here and you can if you want delve deeper into it to def you know, define the warlord if you want in this case or you simply say on its face warlord and you maybe find that out later you find out who specifically it is later if you want mm -hmm. now with the, with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, um, when it came to when it came to um, put when it came to putting in putting in ideas for individual cards, was it a case was it a case of just just brainstorming as many as you could and then narrowing it down, or was there a different method that you had in terms of figuring out what was going to be on the cards and what wasn't? 
Well, having five different themes, we wanted to make sure that there was no uh, no duplicate information. Mm -hmm. So uh, there may be some duplicate concepts, but their specifics are different. So because of the theme being different. For example, you may have a warlord in the epic adventures deck but also a warlord in the political intrigue deck uh but their specifics will be different that way you don't have just a copied card uh wanted to make sure that from the get-go there are unique cards throughout so um the but the 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 whole um uh, the whole underlying concept is you want these unique uh elements of the story so that you can create a unique story every single time that you dive into it. And all of these elements work with each other, no matter what, as long as they're put in the correct orientation or correct order within the story generation process, they will work with each other. The cards will work with each other. All right. Um, now with, with that kind of thing, with that kind of thing in mind, were there, were there any were there any instances you you can think of 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 a of a concept that you're that you're kind of waffling between de between decks on? Some of them, yeah, they got cut from one deck to make sure that they were in a different deck mm -hmm. um, because they just fit better there. So the creative process and uh, Josh Perry has been the primary writer on this, but he and I have had several meetings and you know fleshed out a lot of the details together. Uh, there have been several instances where we had to make the choice. Does this concept and the, the details, do we want this to be in this deck or in this deck? And we try to just make the determination. And one of the funny things is the only people that will even know what got cut is the two of us. And really the limitations that we have are that we've got 60 cards in a deck. So yeah, there could be other concepts and other details, but there's only so many cards that we can provide uh, in a deck and make it reasonable. The other alternative is we make a 5,000 card deck and no one can afford it. So what we what we try to do is give you as much content as possible in as few cards as possible and make it as inexpensive and accessible as possible. Um, now, with, now, with that kind of thing in mind, since, since I meant since... I mentioned the whole thing about about waffling. I'm curious if there were some, if there were some cards that it took a, it took a little bit of squeezing to act, to actually get to actually get the concept from idea from idea to paper, or some that were a bit trickier to um, get to get on the page. Well, that just comes down to the creative ability of the writer, mm -hmm. really. Uh, and what we're trying to do is squeeze as much of our creative juices out of our brains, I love the visual, uh, so that our customers don't have to. So it's, it's I, I think that the more work we do now, the less work we have to do later. Mm -hmm. And so that's been one of the main driving forces behind the development of it. Uh, as a whole is let's put in the work now so that it covers as many bases as possible, is as versatile as possible, but also leave it as vague as is necessary so that it is as versatile as possible. Not not an easy task, but we've got a pretty good creative team. All right. Now with now with that with that kind of thing in mind, um with the, as we mentioned before, with each card there are four, there are um four uh, there are four options. Mm -hmm. Um. Now the now the whole idea the whole idea of at of adding of adding four specifically on that was was that something that was decided on early on, or were there experiments to have more or less options in the early stages? So four was always our minimum. If we had the ability to do six we would have certainly gone that route, but from a practical standpoint, the amount of space you have on the card means we could have done six with 
less detail or four with more detail. Mm -hmm. And we opted for four in that case. Which I I can I can cer I can certainly see why you guys would take why you guys would take that particular route simply because mm -hmm. uh, more detail means m means more opportunities to present idea present story ideas. Mm -hmm. Um. But if if you don't if you don't mind, I would I would like I would like to pick I would like to pick your brain on a on the. On the potential combinations of one of one of the decks, if you have if you have that on hand, which deck? Um, let's st let's start let's start simple and let's go let's go with um contracts and bounties. Okay, let me. Uh, I actually have it in a spreadsheet form, mm -hmm. which uh, all the details are fleshed out in there. So let me pull that up. So yeah, I can. I, what I can do is actually roll a d4 to simulate the um, um, the the picking, or you know, like I, I can roll. I can roll a d12 actually to uh, show the uh, the randomness of picking the card, and then I can roll a d4 to get the the fleshed out detail if you want. I'd I'd appreciate I'd appreciate that. It'll give the sure. um, it'll give the old call trap some use aside aside from. Aside from being a landmine in, in my ki in my kitchen, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. So, so um, whenever whenever you're ready, roll roll away with the uh, D, with the D twelve, and then we'll narrow things down with the D four. All right. So I have a celebrity. Mm -hmm. Then when I go, I'll, I'll just roll them both together. Here we go. Uh, and then we have a four, so a monarch. All so. Right. The the actor will be a celebrity, specifically mm -hmm. a monarch. Okay, uh, the action is going to be. We'll hire you to capture. So let me go down to capture and uh, the uh, location is going to be in a demi plane mm -hmm. so you're going to need to go to the demi plane to capture and the subject is going to be a construct mm -hmm. what type of construct uh let me scroll down uh construct and it's going to be an animated armor and then the developments are a six but justice comes from an unexpected source and the unexpected source is going to be planar. So on its face, we have a monarch who is going to hire, I assume, the uh, adventuring party in this mm -hmm. case uh, to go to a demiplane to capture a construct that construct being an animated suit of armor. Mm -hmm. And, oh, excuse me, I, I skipped intent, sorry. Uh, let's see, let's see, to control nature. That's their whole uh, purpose. So let's go to nature. And the aspect of nature is for terrain. So they want you, so, so their intent uh, in having you go to this demi plane and uh, capture this animated armor, is that they want to control nature, specifically mm -hmm. terrain. But the uh, development said, but justice comes from an unexpected source. So what they're doing is probably nefarious. We can assume mm -hmm. that based on on that development, um, and then that unexpected source is planar. Mm -hmm. Now, what all that means, you need to figure out how that plays into your story. Mm -hmm. In my case, I'm going to say that uh, the monarch is um, going to... Oh, actually, I, I read the wrong thing. I said celebrity, right? Yes. Uh, foreign celebrity is actually military veteran. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Sorry, sorry. Lots of lots of outcomes here. So military veteran mm-hmm. wants you to travel to a different plane of existence and capture a, an animated armor. Um, then, and their intent is to use it to control nature, specifically the terrain of an area. So I got to think, okay, animated armor, what is special about this animated armor? Does this animated armor... Um, is it related to nature in any way? Is it constructed from the bark of some tree and it, it gives uh, some supernatural powers? Originally was worn by somebody with these supernatural powers to shape earth. Uh, you know, maybe that's, maybe the owner of the armor has the ability to do these things. So it's not necessarily the item in this case, you know, animated armor that the military veteran is looking to uh, use to control nature. They're going to use the armor as a bargaining chip to get someone to control nature. Let's just say so lots of different options there on, on how you might structure the story, but at its base, you know, at its, core elements, a military veteran is hiring you to travel to a different uh, uh, demiplane to capture this uh, animated armor and their overall intent is to use it to control nature. Uh, But there will be a development somewhere along the way and that is that justice comes from an unexpected source which is uh, planar. So what creatures come through uh, to uh, our um, our existence in order to stop this military veteran from doing it, uh, or what message do you you as the heroes of the story receive from this uh, uh, planar entity in order to um, enact justice against the uh, military veteran? Maybe before they can uh, do what they want to do. Maybe there's a castle in the in the mountains and they want to create a giant sinkhole and drop that castle and the kingdom down into it because of you know some um grudge that they have against it not sure they were never able to sack the city and now they just determine there's a way that they can just erase it from ever uh, uh, from total existence so Mm -hmm. who knows lots of different options there now when it comes to when it comes when it comes now um it's the way you said it it sounds it sounds like you've got mo- you've got most of the decks on um on on spreadsheet form is that is that accurate yeah so for development purposes it makes sense to organize all of our thoughts in uh, a spreadsheet and we've got uh, one spreadsheet per deck helps us to make sure that everything works with each other because having to lay all this out and then print uh, prototypes and then use the prototypes, not that practical when you can just organize them in a D12 uh, format and roll a die. Mm -hmm. Now, given that, given that, given that since we, since we tackled something on the relative low key, although, although, um, how anything involving planar travel is going to be lo- is going to be low key. I'll leave up to you. <laughs> so, I'd like to, I'd like to next tackle the opposite end of end of the spectrum with um, epic adventures. Okay. So epic adventures. Let's see here. Uh, let's get a d12 and a d4. All right. So, an undead overlord. And it is going to be a lich. Nice. I love liches. Mm-hmm. Will transform and to stone. So they're going to turn to stone a legendary creature. So let's see here. Legendary creature. And it was a unicorn. Oh, how dastardly to do such a thing. Uh, And their intent, 
out of spite. Okay. And let's see, spite. Out of spite. Uh, insult. And then the development. Three is going to be, but their only weakness is a part of a powerful artifact. And let's find out what that par powerful artifact is. Uh, three is lethal poison. So on its face, we have an undead overlord who is a lich is going to transform a unicorn into stone out of spite and uh what was it that i got out of spite was insult but the development will be that their only weakness is poison so let's say that this lich has somehow been insulted in their mind by the unicorn the unicorn is obviously very symbolic and they're usually very cool magical creatures let's say that this unicorn happens to be uh, some sort of a symbol of a kingdom so it wasn't the unicorn that insulted directly the lich but in fact the rulers of this realm who did it and the unicorn is somehow related to the power that that realm has. So either, you know, political or literally magical power that they derived from that unicorn. So to uh, have revenge on them, you know, uh, because of their spite, they're going to go ahead and turn this thing to stone. And you find out along the way somewhere that the only weakness that the lich has is some sort of poison now poison to uh i mean if you look at at a uh, uh a stat block for a lich you might look at that and go well i mean how are they going to have a reaction to poison well poison for you and poison for a lich might be two very different substances the end goal is to impair them or kill them with poison, but what actual chemical compounds are required may be vastly different. Mm. So keep that in mind. Uh, but yeah, that's that's. I think that's a pretty awesome e epic adventure. So mm -hmm. the player characters are tasked with uh, going and trying to get from the Lich some antidote to save the, uh, the unicorn. Um, unicorn and uh, for anyone, anyone listening we're making all this up on the fly yeah. none of this was prepared in advance <laughs> so no, uh, anybody the, who know anybody who knows my show knows that i don't prep things in advance yeah so let's just say that we need to uh go and maybe we want to um uh learn about the lich first that's you know a lot of information maybe needs to be gathered and we find out that the lich uh has their uh phylactery you know somewhere close by or you know impossible to actually locate but we do find out along the way of some sort of poison that would work against this lich and so we decide that we are going to you know somehow capture the lich and then threaten it with the poison and get it to undo the spell that it used to turn the unicorn to stone. And by doing so, restores the power or the political or whatever you want, however you want to bring that into the story when it comes to the, um, uh, I just made that up off the top of my head that it's more of a realm that has insulted the lich. But of course it could have been <laughs> literally the, uh, the unicorn insulting the uh, the lich directly now we could of course change any of that we could draw a different card if we wanted to uh, on any different element and completely change the story across the board so instead of um the 
uh, instead of uh, uh, transform into stone, I'm going to say bribe. So I'm just going to, I just found uh, one of the actions is bribe. And uh, we're going to bribe with significance. So one is one option is money. Uh, one option is magic. One option is might. One option is uh, magnificence. So I'm going to say the lich bribes the unicorn with the promise of magnificence. And the um, intent, let's throw a different D12 out and it's going to be a five. And so now this starts getting really interesting in that it says to overthrow a god. So now the lich is going to bribe the unicorn in order to overthrow a god. And I'm going to say that the unicorn is, let's say, the avatar of a deity on the planet. And therefore, uh, that's how the lich gets at this god and is going to basically uh, try to overthrow them and take their place. All the different details that uh, that come with that. Let's see on the on the overthrow uh, part. Let's see the uh, the method. So to overthrow a god and throwing a d4 here uh, and destroy the pantheon. So. Not only are they going to overthrow the god, but they're also going to destroy the pantheon once they do that. So this lich sees the avatar of the deity as the means by which they can get into the realm in which that pantheon exists. So they can not only overthrow the god, but then destroy that pantheon. So I changed two variables, and then we got that story mm -hmm. instead of the story about the... Um, lich turning the uh, unicorn into stone. So you can see just how crazy things can get. And if you want to mm -hmm. adjust it a little bit here and there, pick a different outcome here and there, and it changes the story entirely. And with, and with, that, with that kind of thing in mind, um, obviously, with obviously with with something like with something like this, a little bit a little bit of flexibility on the on the on the other end of the equation is ne is necessary because, for all intents and purposes, and I think I think I said this when I had when I had tweet on ta talking about Everway, the cards themselves are a se are a series of cues. Yes. Um, you had and you had made you had made allusions to um to Mad Libs er earlier on. I'd say mm -hmm. um. I'd I'd say a couple other things that I'm reminded of seeing that seeing this particular demonstration is well well the the obvious one even though even though you even though you're not going for as much as much um humor as it is is um something like cards against humanity mm -hmm. <laughs> um mm -hmm. but a less a lesser obvious one would be um would be a project by um Q, by Culey called um Channel A um which was all, which was all about which was all about trying to pitch and pitch um um different anime. <laughs> mm, okay. Um, but the re the reason I bring that ki that kind of thing up is you ha is you have a you have a set of pr you have a set of prompts that you're trying to fill in the blanks with. It's um it's apropos that early on you meant you brought up Mad Libs because I think that's one of the big things that's going to come to mind for people. Um. Now, one now given the given the given the fact that you have sixty um car, you have sixty cards in each deck, um and you have as we as we said five five different um five different five different types of cards is that is are the types let me make sh let me do a bit of math here. Well, I get. I guess that explains why you were able to break out a D12 because I'm get. I'm guessing that e that each type within a deck has twelve cards. Yeah, there are twelve actors, twelve actions, twelve subjects, twelve intents, and twelve developments per deck. Um, and when it when it comes to developments, that's one that that's one that I find interesting because 
is it is it required that that only one development is is utilized nope. or is or is there the possibility that more, that more than one um more than one card could be used on on a re on a reading with this kind of thing so this is an interesting interesting aspect you can use as many cards as you want on every single element mm -hmm. so you could use you know three cards for the actors one card for the action two cards for the subjects three cards for the intents mm -hmm. and 10 cards for the developments it, it doesn't it, it's so versatile or you can stick to one of each if you want mm -hmm. i think that throwing in more than one development card is a great idea mm -hmm. and it's just depending on how complicated do you want it to get. Uh, additionally, you can create multiple storylines all happening at the same time or as a result of each other, if you want. So you could have something happen. You know, in our in our case, you know, we created a, a story about uh, the lich originally turning um, the unicorn to stone. Well, there could be a story in which that's what happened first and then thought about it more and decided to use them as a means to an end in instead of um instead of their original intent then they decided to go about it a different way you know turn them back into normal apologized and then tried to influence the, that unicorn into uh, opening up a gateway into its deity's uh, plane of existence. So you could have something that's sort of a multi-stage adventure if you want to as well. Uh, again, every card is a prompt. Every card is meant to establish uh, the who, what, where, why, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And Given that you, given that you mentioned the possibility of at, of adding cards, is there is there the possibility that um that one particular avenue of card could be skipped if it did if it didn't fit the um, scheme? Well, if it's not working for some reason in your envisioned story, or if you already have an idea of what the intent is, you already have an idea of who the big bad is, and therefore you don't need an actor card. Skip it. There's no reason why you have to use, you know, it's more like guidelines than actual rules here. There's no reason why you have to use anything uh, that we presented if you already have a good concept in your mind for that aspect of the story. Mm -hmm. um, that The intent part is, is something interesting to me when I consider the context of something like relics and artifacts. Sim because when a lot of people put those two together, they're thinking of um, of sentient of sentient items, talking swords, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I can I can uh, call out a few intents on that deck. Uh, one intent is to sell mm -hmm. the item. One is to open use the item to open a planar gate, uh, summon a creature, a cast a forbidden spell, commit a crime, increase their power. Mm -hmm. recruit an army you know lots and lots of, of different possibilities and those are all the the top level cues and then within each one of those was four additional options pertaining to that top level cue all right, all right i can get i can get behind that um when it when it comes now when it comes to um so when it comes to sim when it comes to something like simple side quests, I could see, I could see that poten that potentially having a having a wide berth about what about what about what would count as simple in that regard. Um, was that was that something that you guys had to na had to narrow down in terms of what it what would fall under the banner of simple side quests? So yes, uh, there's there's certainly uh, a little bit of a different format happening there, and that is if I just read across the top, I see an innkeeper needs to find a goblin camp to recover stolen goods, but time is running out. Mm -hmm. So I literally just read the first card from each one of those columns, mm -hmm. but within 
the innkeeper are four different options for that innkeeper's general disposition because that's the thing that you're going to be interested in when you're interacting with the, the innkeeper. Mm -hmm. So their general disposition is there. Uh, so on the needs to find, we have a known location, a rumored location, an unknown location, or a dangerous location. So these are um, helping you to flesh out how difficult this is going to be to accomplish. When I go to a goblin camp, I see that there's uh, bugbear allies, an ogre boss, wild magic is at their disposal, uh, warg mounts. Mm -hmm. So lots of different elements can be thrown into there. And then when I see to recover stolen goods, I see supplies, treasure, magic items, and medicine as being options there. Uh, and then under developments, but time is running out. I see you've got a year, a week, a day, an hour. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think we're going to actually change that one year to a month, probably a year would be a little bit too long. Yeah. <laughs> the, the beautiful part about this is all of these things are extremely easy to change. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't change anything without a you know, an approval from Josh because uh, he's the one, the main writer on this. But because all the content for these is all in our uh, Google Docs, that automatically updates to the InDesign document when we're laying it out. So one little change and all it does is notify Ralph, there's a uh, an update on the Google Doc. Would you like to uh, implement the updates? And he says, yes, and we fix a typo or we change uh, a year to a month. It's extremely versatile and uh, it's it's a very, very efficient way of, of running uh, through the creative process all the way to production. Mm -hmm. Now, with all, with all that in mind, what are you guys shooting for as far as a release window? Well, stretch goals have unlocked a few things. We're gonna need to uh, commission some more artwork from our artist, uh, she's done an amazing job so far, but artwork does take time. So we're expecting to get uh, new pieces of artwork from her. And then uh, in the meantime, really just make sure that everything, all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed and the manuscript looks just top notch. We have a uh, an editor who will be reviewing all of the content and making sure that everything has been triple checked and then um, basically just getting the cards and all the card deck artwork ready for production. Uh, and then it goes to production. They take however many weeks or months it's going to take for production, however many units we order. And then it gets shipped to each one of our warehouses around the world. Mm -hmm. Now, and I'll, I'll certainly be keeping an eye on how, on how, on how it develops from my, from my particular vantage point, if you will. Yeah. Well, we've given ourselves a year to fulfill. If we can fulfill it faster than that, of course we will. There's, there's absolutely nothing stopping us other than our work commission and, uh, like I said, editing and production. Uh, the longest of which will probably be the artwork. Uh, so the card decks and stuff usually get produced uh, once production starts within a couple of weeks. So um, hopefully, I mean, I'm saying this right now on July 5th, 2021, hopefully the shipping situation is going to be better by the end of the year. But I don't know. There are still huge problems when it comes to ports and transportation in general uh, of container ships and that kind of thing. It's a bit nuts. At any given time, there have been dozens of boats anchored out in front of ports just waiting to come in. That's not normal. Usually it's less than like 10 because of how scheduling works and all that stuff. But with how much uh, shipping and transportation has been backed up due to COVID, it could be literally weeks before a boat that has arrived in, let's say, San Francisco actually gets to unload 
their cargo. Mm. And we've seen this time and time again, product is, is uh, manufactured, product is shipped, boat arrives, can't unload. And then we're notified, boat can't unload. Sorry, we expected to be able to give it to you by the fifth, but it, you know, boat can't unload until next month. And then we just have to wait. Mm -hmm. So, which is a major bummer, but it is what it is at this point in time. I'm hoping that it is, um, that issue is solved in the future. Yeah. Now, with, and now with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Happy to do it. Uh, you know, happy to, to contribute to the overall conversation in our industry. And uh, I, I love anytime uh, I can get a chance to talk about gaming. I love the uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, thanks so much for having me. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>